Hello everyone and welcome to episode 3 of Redefine Healthy Radio. This is Paul Ravella and I'm here with my host, Lauren Collin. How are you, Lauren? I'm great. I love the new setup. This is exciting. Yeah, we're moved into the new office. It's uh, not complete. We're posting this video on YouTube if you're interested in watching the content. Um, watching us dance around talk. <laughs> on video. <laughs> So yeah, if you want to do that, we're definitely going to be like making some changes and trying to improve our mics are sitting on shoe boxes. But yeah, if you're watching, are, oh, I don't even know if you can see what you're watching, but yeah, we are actually on shoe boxes. They are Jordans, so respect. <laughs> but overall, we're just moving forward, doing more and better, right? We're trying to get this thing to the next level, and um, I think we're, I'm really excited about this office, because it's oh, just dedicated to like this stuff, like podcasting and video and work. It's um, just like quiet. Yes. And we're going to have space where everyone comes, they know they can work, and then we have the gym right there if we yep. want to do stuff. We'll have uh, some like cabinets, coffee, right? Yeah, it should be everything, and you can come over anytime you want, steal Wi-Fi and upload your videos <laughs> and quicker than... Yeah, my house has hours. the slowest Wi-Fi, like literally the slowest. So I will come to... It'll take like 14 hours, like yeah. not even exaggerating, like 14 hours for like a 10 minute video. I come to Paul's and it's like... Five minutes. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what's going on with my internet lately, but the other day I uploaded like a 10 minute video and before I got done doing the thumbnail, it was like, your video is live and I was like, holy crap. Yeah. So I had to... That's not nice. <laughs> yeah. Sorry for anybody with slow internet, but that's what you get when you live in the country. <laughs> All right, so let's get into, uh, let's do some, well, Recap. let's talk about the, no, the topic what okay. we're going to talk about okay. today, but everyone knows we're going to talk a little bit about like overtraining, overreaching. Yeah, that is, that is the goal of today uh, and just something that we see a lot with within the community, within our clients and just people who reach out to us. Yeah. Uh, it's just something that's, and we've been guilty of this too. And I think it's really important to learn from your mistakes. Both of us have had injuries. So we've learned, you know, how overtraining Damn injuries. Can, yeah, can really, really affect you and how you need to take steps to, you know, not get there, not even reach that spot. Right. So, but first we wanted to kind of recap the last weekend, which was the Tampa Pro, what is the NPC portion of it called? It's called the NPC Tim Gardner Extravaganza. Okay, so there's that. <laughs> I was like, the NPC Tim Gardner. It's Pro. just the Tampa Pro. I mean, <laughs> yeah. no one that competes at the Arnold calls it the Arnold Amateur when they yeah. get there, even if they're in the amateur. Basically. So, basically, if anyone knows, Tim Gardner does a lot of shows. Uh, he all over. He does a lot in Florida. He does other ones all in San over. Antonio, Puerto Rico. in Puerto Rico, yeah. in Chicago. He just does a He's lot of shows. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think he did a Hawaii show. This yes, year. he did. Hawaii. Yeah. Okay. He does a lot of shows, and he's an amazing promoter. One of my favorite, actually, promoters For sure. to do shows with uh, as an as an amateur and as a pro. So I had the you know I got to do the Tampa Pro actually as my pro debut two years ago. Yeah. And then we went back this year and basically what Tim does differently, particularly for the pros, is that he has almost every single division, not every show, but almost every division. The Tampa Pro had I think every division, uh, top to bottom from females and males. Uh, yeah. For all the pros. One of the few female bodybuilding shows still yes, around. Yes, he does a few female bodybuilding shows. He has one of the big, basically the female bodybuilding is out of the Olympia now and he does the Olympia, I think, for them. No, I was told by a no. friend, Janine, that the Phoenix show is like the Olympia for, what, for bodybuilding yeah. now. Is that his show That's too? That's his show. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you meant the Tampa show, but yeah. No, 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 that he has a show, okay, the Phoenix show. So he does a bunch of good stuff for the pro league as well as NPC shows. There was, I mean, the classes were stacked. It was a very big, I think there was about 200 pros, which is huge. huge show. Uh, if you guys aren't familiar, uh, normally there's just like one or two divisions, maybe. Uh, and so there's about 200 pros, and then I didn't do the final count on the NPC, but I know at least for like open bikini, there was probably like 50 girls. I mean, it was, it was a big show. Yeah, they had three classes, and I want to say there was more than 15 to 20 girls per class, because they had like three, four there was, call outs. There was a lot of I classes. mean, even men's physique was really big. Bodybuilding was, all the classes were full, so it was a, it was a big show. Very it competitive. Big. He told me he sold out pre-judging a thousand seats. That's insane. So, like, one thing about Tim, I mean, he puts on a great show, great product, the Hyatt, mm -hmm. fantastic. He like, brings in hotel. the best, uh, like, expediters and, like, that crew, so they have, everything's very well run, and for anybody who competed or anybody who's interested in competing, he brought in Sandy and Steve to judge both the amateurs and the pros, which is a really big deal. So two yeah. of the head, they are the two head judges for the Olympia, for all the pro league shows. And a lot of times you don't get that necessarily as an amateur until you go to like a national qual, until you go to a national show. Yep. So most national qualifiers don't have Sandy or Steve, let alone both of them. So it was a really cool experience 
for, um, you know, I think for the athletes. And it was, you know, they had a big expo. We had a lot of friends come into town for it. Yeah. So it was just a really, really awesome event. It's cool to have something like that in Tampa because previously, you know, the last, a few years ago, it felt like the closest thing was Orlando, Europa, and even that mm -hmm. doesn't. I don't think that compares right now to the Tampa Pro. I think that's probably the, the premier pro show in, in yeah. Florida. Oh, yeah. for, I mean, that was an amazing show. It was great when I did it two years ago, and then it was yeah. great watching this year, you know, and kind of being like coach figure. So speaking of, <clears throat> also, Paul won a very cool award while we were there. So don't say me because this is one of, this, I'm just someone I'm gonna regret for the rest of my life. So what? <laughs> I'll tell the story um, as I was, so as they were about to announce the bikini overall winner, which we were hoping would be our client Kayla, yes, and um, plot twist it was. We were quite certain it would be her because yeah. okay. when they did the overall comparisons, she was on the left, and they said after one quarter turn they put her in the center, mm -hmm. left it there, and then said let the judges tabulate. So anyone that's familiar with NPC, if, if they throw you in the center, it's almost certainly going to be a good thing for you. So, but right before they did that. I hear uh, they're going to announce a team award, and I have my camera ready and my phone. I'm li literally like right in front of the stage, and they say the word team pro physique. Yeah, Bob's like, can team pro team pro physique come up? And uh, and you kind of just like looked around, and we were because we had all tried to like move up for Kayla, like we yeah. were all kind of sitting sporadically, and then you were kind of like like looking around, like wait, we were like what? And yeah. then you're just like, oh. <laughs> yeah. So Bob Chicarello was like, you know, people were pointing at me, so he like looked at me and said like, come on stage, and I'm like, uh oh. So yeah, I go back around stage and he's like, hey, grab your team. In my head, I thought, oh, all my competitors, I should have got your butt on stage. I'm so mad at myself. No, that was it not. It would have been hilarious to shove that helmet on your head. I, it was um, your award. Obviously, we worked together as a team, but I did not want to steal any of your nah, No, it was, it was fun, though. I mean, you know, to meet Bob Ciccarello on stage, like, you know, he's pretty much the voice of all body. But it just felt cool to be up there. And then what happened like 10 seconds later? 10 seconds later, Kayla uh, won the overall. So uh, we had, <clears throat> th Paul had three clients in the NPC. Uh, I had helped them with posing, and then I had another posing client as well. So we had four girls that we, yeah. you know, knew about in the NPC, all in bikini. And then we had a few pro pro friends too yeah. um, in, NP in the bikini. Um, and then yeah, so Kayla won the overall for both novice and open, which was really, really exciting. Uh, I mean, she looked amazing, and she has a great physique. She has like the total package, so it was really cool to see her hard work awarded. Uh, I, I think for me, the best part about her doing so well is that she needed that boost of confidence. Yes. Anyone that sees pictures of Kayla or meets her is just kind of like overwhelmed at how little she thinks of herself. Oh my god. She's got a lot. You're listening, of Kayla. Girl, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, but we we try to coach her on that. I mean, yeah, and that just takes. It doesn't show on stage. I think no. she poses nice and has oh, nice yeah. poise. But you know, you're worried as a coach, like you know, stress, cortisol when you're off stage, like, and you have to own the stage. You have to literally believe you're Miss Olympia every time you go out there, or it shows. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and I genuinely think she feels this way. You know, you know, some people you feel like, oh no, stop! I'm not that good. No, no, she really, she really is she, like, I look terrible, coach. <laughs> she literally told her boyfriend the night before the show she didn't think she should do the show. She, she cracks us up. She's she's very funny, uh, but she did amazing. We knew she would do amazing, so it was great to see her get awarded for that. But to be fair, there was a girl in her class that oh. we both were like, oh, oh shit, yeah, like, had a little more muscle, um, great shape, very pretty, like. Yeah. This was a stacked the, show. Yeah, the show was very. It was like I don't like, want to say national level. It wasn't on that level, but the the, all the, the first call out, outs yeah. in all the show in all the, the top classes. Two call outs, I would say, were yeah. very competitive. Like everyone had everything, and this again was a you know regional qualifier. Yeah. But I mean, these these girls were all ready for nationals, pretty much. Yeah. Like, you know, they had the hair, the makeup, the tan, the suit, the the physique. I mean, everyone yeah. in the top call outs has tie-ins now at local shows. Yeah, know, the just, sport has definitely taken a huge leap forward. When you see the amateurs and you see the pros, and there's not that huge of a gap between like the bottom am the top amateurs and the bottom pros, you know, like the the bikini division is just becoming very Much very competitive, competitive. Yeah. and um, obviously that depends on too like where you live Florida happens to be a very popular place for competing there's a lot of shows here um, I, I actually heard a number yesterday really and each year there's 79 NPC shows in Florida that doesn't surprise me that's crazy I looked it's up only 52 weeks a year I know no I looked up <laughs> and there's no shows and like well I guess there is there, there's separate. literally shows now yeah. in every month and one of Ryan's friends at the fire station is gonna probably start competing and he's like can you look up the schedule uh, see what shows are left, yeah. and literally in October and November, every weekend, 
sometimes double because yeah. of like different locations sure. there's a show. So well, South Florida is its own world. They could probably have a show every weekend down there. <laughs> yeah. But between Orlando, Tampa, Jacksonville, you know, uh, Megan's favorite, the Fort Myers. <laughs> Gosh, there's she a, loves it there. Uh, Naples, like yeah, Florida. the Port Charlotte yeah. show. I mean, there's just a lot of shows. Is there any shows in Tallahassee? Uh, I think there actually is. Gainesville? There is a. I don't, I don't know about me. Gainesville is rough. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, actually, no. I think there is. I think there is a show in Gainesville. I'm just uh, being silly. I went to Florida State, so in my mind, yeah, we, like, in my mind, Gainesville so, so sucks. But, wife, uh, so uh, uh, but we love Aria, who lives in Gainesville. Who? Speaking of the pros, yes. so we had a few friends in the pro uh, bikini show, and uh, so Aria did amazing, and uh, so did Stacy, uh, Stacy McLeod, Aria Adamy, and then Ruth. What is Ruth now? Married name Wood. Wood, right? Uh, Ruth, my friend Ruth just got married, so her her name is different now. So Ruth actually got second. Uh, it was Arr, so so close. so close. She's been getting some top threes. And this was the last show to qualify for the Olympia. Yeah, for so this the, year. It's the last show for this year, and she, I mean, she looked flawless. So, yeah. um, you know, it's kind of bittersweet, but you know that that's and kind then of the Stacey, sport. Our friend Stacy got third. Yeah, she, no fourth. She got fourth. She okay. got fourth. So that was great. She already she's already going to the Olympia. She just wanted to get a little bit more stage time. Yep. And then um, Ari, I believe, got tenth or eleventh, which is still great. Um, obviously, everyone hopes to be in the first call out, you know. But it the reality is there's so many great competitors, yep. and she was just a little off from her best, and she knows that. So. Um, it was just a really tough division. I think there was like 28 or 29 bikini girls. Yeah, there was at least and five call ups. I mean, that it's, I can think of. it's very competitive, you know, obviously in the IFBB league as well as that show. Even when I, when I did that show, I think there was like 33 girls. Like, it, it's yeah. always a massive. Well, anyone show. who puts as much out as Tim Gardner does, like, you get it back. I mean, mm -hmm. have you traveled in the last two years to a show and not seen Tim Gardner? <laughs> no. He's at every show. He's either judging. Or promoting a show, yeah. and uh, he just knows how to take care of the athletes, which yeah. means a lot to us because that's what makes me want to do a show or not do a show. Yeah. And it just, you know, it's, it was a really, really well-run production. So we obviously can't say enough good things about the show. Uh, and if you guys are ever interested in a show, it's usually like the first week of August. Yeah. Um, that's kind of like a good, good last show if you're trying to maybe like do nationals. Like well, even that. like if you're a fan of the bodybuilding, there was, you know, it's an Olympia qualification, so some good bodybuilders showed oh, up. Oh yeah. Like, the whole show. What's the guy, Josh from? Josh Lenardowitz. Like, Aussie, Aussie, Aussie. Yeah, he got a, he got a, what, third at the Arnold, I think? Yeah. And like seventh I, or eighth at the Olympia? Took, I think he took pretty much the whole time off and just prepped for the show. Yeah. And, the and I, I heard him say that, you know, he wasn't really peaked. He's going to come in even better for the Olympia. Mm -hmm. And he just, he edged out Max Charles, who he's got mm -hmm. more muscle than, than Josh, but not as good as symmetry. So even seeing them and then our good friend, Josh Vogel, we can't forget. Yeah. Oh, Josh yeah. Vogel won the light heavyweight class. And then, his coach, uh, mm -hmm. Joe Bennett, and him actually had an overall pose down where yeah, they were like that touching was super each other's cool. glutes and quads. <laughs> okay, that just made it sound super creepy. Hey. Uh, <laughs> Josh. For everyone, for everyone listening, uh, they were not being creepy, but yeah. <laughs> uh, no, so they both train out at MI40, uh, and hypertrophy coach is Joe, if you guys don't know. He puts out a lot of really good content, so definitely would suggest following him. So yeah, both they, those guys. Um, great coaches and great content. They got, it was really cool. That was like their goal was to both win their respective classes and then be able to do the overall pose down. So that was cool to get to see that. Uh, we just saw a lot of people that we knew too. Like so many people came into town and it was just a really good event. Yeah, I love when the expos kind of feel like a shrunk down version of like the Olympia or the Arnold mm -hmm. where you see a lot of familiar faces. Like I didn't say hi to him, but even Neil Hill was here. And yeah. You know, there was just some people that you recognize in the fitness industry. Jose Raymond was there, um, just walking around. It just—it actually felt like I don't know. It's the first time to me that it actually felt like a significant like IFBB NPC show slash expo. Yeah, it was really. It was I, I'll be surprised if he doesn't have to move it in the near future. I don't know. That venue is awesome. It is yeah. awesome, but well, I don't know. Maybe maybe there's a little more room in there. But selling out a thousand seats, you know, you don't want to limit. That's pretty crazy. Um, and the athletes aren't going to be any less next year either. You know, like it's, it's building a reputation. Mm -hmm. And thank you for letting us film, Tim. We were actually able to do pictures and videos. Yeah, that was The year nice. you did it, it was like they were no. slapping the phones out of our hand. Mm -hmm. so, well, I don't know because I was on stage, but yeah, that's what, that's what I was told. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Good eight success. <laughs> All right. So that's it. What's next for us? What's the next thing we're going to? Because it's kind of like. What is the next thing we're going to? I mean, as far four as weeks show? is the Olympia. Oh, shit. Yeah. Four weeks to the Olympia, so that's I happening. Really I keep forgetting, it's like literally in a few weeks. I also just recently heard there's 100 days left in the year, which sounds insane. 
Uh, yeah, I honestly feel like an old person, but I feel like this year has gone really quickly. I think we've just done so much. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I have, I have a few things going on before the Olympia. That's why I feel like it's farther away. But yeah. I guess everything's just crammed in. You just <laughs> like usual. Like uh, for those that don't know, Karina Naboa now works for me. She's going to be the producer of this podcast. So. The producer. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm what letting I'm letting her take over my life because <laughs> I tend to like not pay attention to things, not buy flights, not rent cars, not yes. get hotels, and have to do it at the last minute. So, yeah, that's Wait, really. I more. never noticed. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, we have to be in Austin tomorrow. Great, I'll just go get a flight right now. Yeah, like that. Happens Paul is great to travel with because he's very laid back. But sometimes we laid back is good. We definitely we forget some details sometimes. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, so the Olympia will be as far as like us together. That'll be the next thing. I'm going to be doing a bunch of stuff. I'll be in St. Louis next week, and then, or I guess in, in a full week, and then I'm going down to South Florida, and then I'll be speaking in Orlando. And then we'll have the Olympia, so I'll be doing yeah. a bunch of little things. I think that'll be a really fun post uh, Olympia podcast. We'll probably have a ton of stuff to talk about. Oh, that. we'll literally just make it on the Olympia. Yeah, I think that'd be yeah Olympia. Just experience Olympia. review. So <laughs> yeah, I think that's. I think we're caught up. We don't have to go too in detail with with the Olympia. Everyone knows what that is. Um, if gonna, you don't, it's the uh, the biggest. It's, it's, in the, it's in the desert, so that the makes biggest it fun. Bodybuilding show. Anytime you can go to Vegas, it's a good bigger. excuse to go there. Um, yeah, and I think the, the 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 most exciting thing for me was I was trying to get one of those sky boxes for the Olympia, but Karina found out that that's only for sponsors. So now I got to figure out uh, okay, figure what the sponsorship knew, level is that, for that. I don't think I'm there yet. But, yeah, I knew um, there had to be something because we couldn't yeah. find it easily like online. No, so we'll be at the Olympia watching the show, but not in the sky boxes yeah. as of. And now they changed it. So on Saturday now. Which is super cool for me because it's all the stuff that I like. But it's bikini yeah. finals oh, okay. and bo Body men's bodybuilding finals. Oh, last finals. year, yeah, last year it was pre-judging. Was pre -judging. So oh, okay. typically they'll do bikini on Friday, but now they're making it. Look bikini moving up. I know. I think bikini's just moving up. So last year it was Friday they did bikini yeah. finals. Yeah. So uh, I'm pretty excited. So wait, are the girls all in one show day now? No, they're oh, two. Friday. So that kind of sucks because pre-judging for bikini is actually at the expo. If anyone's interested, yeah. usually it's. Figure and then uh, figure and then bikini usually go on kind of together yeah. and it's all the way in the back of the expo and then uh, Normally they would have had it on Friday and that's when men's bodybuilding prejudging is but now they're having it on finals So it's just gonna be like a really big show. So I'm gonna get tickets for that for sure. Well, let's get to the topic at hand so Lauren and I when we talk to clients, we talk to people, we, we see things. I think we start to notice trends. I definitely notice a lot of trends. I know, do you notice when people start to get sick? I start to oh get like the same email. Oh my gosh, I, I get like flu, really flu, weird trends. Flu, flu, yeah. flu, and I'm like, uh-oh, CDC, <laughs> lock it down. Just don't go outside. Um, and so like a trend that we've kind of noticed lately and we've kind of discussed and um, you know adjusted our coaching based on this would be like the topic, I think the overwhelming term would be overtraining. But there's a mm -hmm. lot of variations and um, how we describe There's a lot that. of nuances to that, but basically the, the idea of always thinking that you need to do more yep. in order to be better. So what a lot of people forget, and I feel like every time I talk about stuff, I pick on bikini girls, but the only reason I pick on bikini girls is because sometimes or a majority of us can lose the bodybuilders understand that they need to do things in a certain way and it's going to take time, right? Yeah. Whereas bikini girls are like, oh, I only need to like, you know, make this little tweak so they think they can go, 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 go. And just females in general, I feel yeah. like, are always trying to do more. Now, from what we do know, females can tolerate a little bit more volume and recover better than males, but you don't need to always beat yourself into the ground. Yeah. And a lot of people will find themselves in this kind of overtrained state. And that's kind of the word we're going to use, you know, whatever you want to call it. But there, there is like a scientific, you know, term for that. Uh, but just the idea of thinking that you always have to do more in order to be better. Whereas maybe if you properly periodize things, or you had, to, I, I always, and you've been doing this too. Say, uh, say we're not programming for clients. So we, me and Ryan, program for clients, but not all of them, right? So right. training. If we are programming for you, there are written in deloads. If I'm not controlling your training, but people still give me feedback on what they're doing, yeah. I'm like, hey. You need to maybe slow it down this week. Only train three days. Make sure you take two days in a row off. Make sure you're sleeping eight hours. You know all these things, and they're like, "Oh my gosh, I feel so much better like the next week." So, I understand that it's scary when you're always trying to be better and do more, but sometimes you need to kind of take a step back. Yes. Yeah, I, I definitely um, 
I program in like frequency changes for some people. So I'll have them go to five or six days of training, down to three or four, also change the intensity of the training. Oh yeah. But with, with the specific, when you were talking about like bikini competitors or competitors in general, I think what, what, what gets in our heads as we've both gone through this is like you say, I have seven weeks left. Mm -hmm. That's 49 days. I know. So for 49 days, I need to do as much as possible to make progress. Yeah. And like logically in the competitor's brain, this makes sense. Like yeah. do more, do more, get better mm -hmm. results. But when you're objective about it and you're a coach and you can see that someone is like suffering, they're not training as well, they're, they're having digestive issues, yeah. they're not when sleeping as yeah. much. When, and part of that is just prep. Part of that is you can't get away from this state of chronically feeling tired, yeah. having sleep issues, you know, being stressed out. Like those are all normal things. But yes. if throughout the prep you kind of properly periodize things, and take deloads, and then sometimes, yeah, like we we've been experimenting with like the diet breaks and stuff. Uh, that's something that Eric yeah, Holmes taught us. Amazing. And honestly, like I feel I feel bad that I haven't ever talked about this before until right. until now. But we only really learned about it like last year, and now we've been implementing it. And it's something that we should have been doing before, but we just you know we didn't know about it. So honestly, like if you look back at the history of. Um your competitive days and as a coach in mine, it's something that I probably should have noticed earlier on. I know. Because something that I always noticed was my clients would drop weight during peak week. And mm -hmm. a lot of it was because I would reduce the cardio, yep. up the calories, mm -hmm. and then I always thought it was like a metabolic response. Like, oh, their metabolisms mm -hmm. are speeding up. But, but really their body is I just think like, it was like inflammation, recovery. Yeah, their body just kind of relaxes. And I just noticed everyone got better if they did multiple shows and didn't go off the rails yeah. after the show. So, but it's hard because there's a point where you really got to just grind and everyone is different, yeah. right? There's some people who get leaner, I don't want to say easier, but some people have an easier time getting sure. leaner, right? And then there's other people who really, really struggle. And you do have to crush those people at I some point. I put you in the struggle category. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so at some point, that's just, that's just my reality, right? And yeah. I, but I know that. But I'm not doing it, I'm not unnecessarily doing it. Right. So I do know when to kind of take a step back. And I wanted to talk a little bit about kind of how we've, you know, we have both have had injuries. Uh, not, you know, like I didn't rip the, my quad off my bone and have like my <laughs> femur sticking. I mean, no, nothing like that. But we've had pretty chronic things come up. And really the best way to deal with this is not even getting there in the first place, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> so doing things that are preventative are usually better than doing things that are rehabbing you. Yeah, I think the, the best way to do things is the longer you've been training is to actually pay attention and not push yourself on a day when you don't feel great or when you start to notice a trend of some aches or some pains, we can tend to like go, oh, you know, that's when it's most most important to grind. Don't listen to your body, mm -hmm. just crush 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 things and you know, especially when you're talking about powerlifting, which we've both done a lot mm -hmm. of. Oh, well, There's days when you go in the gym yeah. for powerlifting where you literally can't even move until you've done like 20 minutes of foam rolling work. Yeah. Um, well, powerlifting is, is vastly different than bodybuilding. Yeah. And um, I think that I think that both of them can mix, but I think that it is more appropriate when you are a bodybuilder to understand that you can take a step back and still get really, really good workouts without having to do powerlifting type stuff, or at least periodize it and regulate it so that you can do some stuff that day and then other day you're yeah. doing strictly bodybuilding stuff. I mean, you can get a really good workout with really heavy weight and you can get a really good workout with very light weight yeah. with special like techniques of how to lift, you know, yeah. little rest, you know, the cliff does the blood volume sets, the partials, like all these, yeah. there's plenty of ways to increase how hard your workout is without using a lot of weight. And I had to develop a lot of that since I've been dealing with my hip glute bullshit for like a year. Uh, and you know, obviously I didn't have the best workouts for a long time because of working around it. But now I've kind of figured out, I'm getting, I'm on the up. And yeah, I'm adding and, and honestly like seeing you train and training with you over the last couple of weeks and months, I've noticed a difference in like the quality of your workouts. Mm -hmm. You look like you're working out, not trying to survive being yeah. in the gym for an hour. And, and that was, I mean, that was my reality for a while, and I couldn't, there was nothing I could do about that, right? It was only, I could only do what didn't bother me, and every day was kind of like the jungle, you know? Sure. So, but now, I'm being a lot smarter. I'm not like, before, I would feel good. What would happen is I would feel good for a day, and then I'd go in and do something, and then I would retweak whatever. Right. So, now, I'm a lot smarter. I'm trying to be smarter. <laughs> I still have my stupid days, but I'm trying to be smarter and go in, okay, this doesn't feel bad. Let me push it to about this percentage, you know? Right. And then back off and then do my other stuff and then no pain. And then the next time I go in and I improve again. That's, so what she's talking about is called auto-regulation. Yeah. And, it's, and it's actually kind of an advanced 
method of training because uh, Lauren has a master's degree in exercise science, although she doesn't talk like that sometimes. Um, but I'm also studying exercise science with Dr. Campbell. Thanks. Yes, so <laughs> I want to Lauren is stupid. <laughs> let's let's get into no. Let's let's get into like a little bit of the exercise science background because what I think is interesting in you know, there's a lot of bodybuilding dogma that they've accidentally stumbled upon that's actually very correct. Mm -hmm. But they do it for a reason other than like a scientific principle. They do it because they've been training that way for decades and these are kind of some of the things that have come out about it. But like something like the uh, general adaptation syndrome, like that's something that when I started learning about that, it made so much sense. Mm -hmm. So why don't you explain that a little bit and we'll talk about how I think that applies to what we do as coaches. Yeah, well, you were the one who said you just researched all that stuff. Yeah, well, I, look, you so like go, the, three fa it. the three phases of the general <laughs> adaptation syndrome are basically You're the first phase is like the alarm. Mm -hmm. So like think of this as if you've never been in the gym and you go in and you train. Oh, forget what video it. Yeah, we are. Your body's like, what the fuck did you just do to me? Like that's the alarm phase, right? Mm -hmm. Then you get the response. The body adapts to that. Now, this trend kind of drops. When you, when you have an alarm phase, your performance, your soreness, mm -hmm. so you actually have a drop. And then when you come back up, if you interrupt that by training too soon or training too hard again, you can actually interrupt the recovery process. And I think that's a lot of times what happens with us in the gym, and that's where we get some soft tissue issues. I mean, possibly muscle issues, but even in more depth, I'm talking about like, like CNS, recovery issues. So what are some of the signs of overtraining? Yeah, like, so overtraining is actually, so a lot of people throw this word around, but this actually is something that is documented. You know, if you open up an exercise physiology textbook, like you're going to see this. So however people use it in, in other contexts is up to them. But as far as the science behind it, it's just the general symptoms of, okay, like you're just overly tired, you're irritable, you are, you know, disrupted sleep you are at a higher propensity to be injured or sick. Um, you, so basically. Sounds like all women to me. Sounds like all females. Sorry to hit any girls. <laughs> sounds like My all females. My especially, doesn't uh, sleep. 24 seven and uh, just very, it, your body basically is screaming like it's stressed out. And yep. again, you have to think of, it's hard because everything I feel like I say is like, uh, what's what's the word? It, uh, it can go back on each other, like it, um, Double sided, two sided? Yeah, kind of, yeah. So basically, okay, we don't want you to overtrain, but at some point in prep, you're gonna have all those symptoms. Yes. So it, I know it sounds kind of like, okay, I'm putting my foot in my mouth, is that, whatever. Whatever the hell the term is, it, you're going to have to feel those symptoms at some point, but chronically, yeah. you know, for weeks, but whereas maybe if you start to feel like that and you take a deload week and you maybe prioritize yeah. sleep and whatever, you might feel a thousand times better. So and this I, is another great reason yeah, to start prep a little you're... earlier. Yeah. And so not put yourself not at 12 weeks out having to lose 30 pounds. Oh, well, I mean, that's just, yeah, you don't want to do that. So a uh, little plug for mass. So if you guys aren't aware, mass is a research review from Eric Helms, Greg Knuckles, and uh, Mike Zordos. So they have seven articles and then two videos every month. The videos are gold. Like I watched yeah. Eric's this past one. I mean, all the ones I've watched have been really good, but this one was, uh, it was an hour long. Yeah. And it was how to like periodize your diet. So he talks about the stuff that, I mean, we've spent in-depth time with Eric, so I understand, like I know this stuff, but these are like brand new concepts to some people. Right. So, you know, taking, and obviously he's talking about you know, natural bodybuilding and males, so a lot of times their preps are different, understandably. But he's talking on the timelines of like eight months, right? Which sure. I've done those preps, they're very hard, so there's pros and cons to that too. But we can talk about that in another podcast. But basically talking about you're giving yourself enough time to, when you stall out, have these diet breaks. Right. And if anyone doesn't know, in the way that they've kind of used these terms, diet breaks, is, uh, or how Eric has used it and talked with other people about it, is setting your week at maintenance calories and dropping your cardio roughly by half, you know, plus or minus a little bit. Yeah. So planning those in on purpose and then having enough time, you know, that's really the goal. So obviously at some point you're, at, at some point everybody gets to a body fat where they're just constantly tired, hungry, depleted, feeling like shit. And that's just the reality of dieting to a very lean body fat percentage. If we all were meant to be that way, we would just walk around that way, right? And our bodies are clearly trying to fight us. But if you can do things like take a structured deload, um, or maybe take two days off in a row, because a lot of girls, again, they, I want to do more, 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 more. Oh, I don't feel good, so I went on a run. Yeah, exactly. 
I mean, you, you're gonna have, you're eating more food, you're probably gonna gain weight. But some people have a really a hyper response to this, again, because their bodies are stressed out and for whatever reason, that they actually might lose a little bit. So in that case, he will continue the diet break. So yeah, really so just, I, well, so when we got back from Australia, I immediately started looking at my clients that were kind of struggling or having mm -hmm. these issues, and I started implementing it, and I had one yeah. particular client that went on a four-week diet break and lost for four weeks straight yeah. before we had to put her That's back crazy. into uh, dieting calories. Yeah. So imagine if she had just stayed restricted for this. So it's kind of frustrating when you go, oh, what have I been doing to my clients all these years? But the information is kind of new. Yeah, we're always we're learning. learning. We're always evolving. You yeah. know? And that's, I think, the best thing. It would be terrible if we learned about that and then we didn't implement it. You know, So we're doing the best. Yeah. Obviously, that's why we try to stay up to date with either research reviews or research or hang around in the Or even just other coaches yeah. that are kind oh. of doing things. Like, I learned so much from I think being as coaches. One of the <laughs> biggest issues with coaches is that they're kind of too prideful. They don't they don't work alongside with other coaches or talk to other coaches or find out what methods have been working for them and yeah. honestly spending always, time with the coaches that. that we have spent time with, it's been so beneficial to go, well, what do you do when this happens? Or what do you do when this happens? And, and most people who are actually good don't mind. Like we, no, no, we no. picked Eric's brain when we were with him. Yeah. And then when I went to the physique summit, I was with some of the top coaches that have been around for you know 10 years. Yeah. And I got to ask them a million questions, do videos with them, you know. So yeah. it's it's really been cool for us to kind of learn more about this. And funny, I have a client who's seven weeks out. She's been, we've been kind of, you know, having a killer, but that's just normal. You know, most females have to get pretty low calorie. Right. Uh, and that's just kind of the reality of prep. So she's seven weeks out and then um, she was kind of struggling a little bit. And then I was like, hey, we need to do a diet break this week. And she's like, I really would rather push. I'm like, we don't have any other time to do the diet break. Right. We're going to do this this week. And then we have six more weeks of dieting. And she was very, very hesitant. And um, you know, I, I, I'm hoping that she actually followed through this week. You know, I, I'm not there to see if she did, right. but uh, she'll report on Monday if she did or not. But I'm really, really hoping that she did because I, I think what happens is people look at diet break and also just uh, you know, deload week, the the semantics of it, people freak out. Yeah, and they're like, oh, it's a break? Oh my god, I'm no no no, this is this is to make you better. Right. Taking time away, a little bit of time away from training and actually recovering is actually better for you. Like we wouldn't recommend it otherwise, you know? Right. So I think that you have there's a there's obviously a fine line of working very hard, killing yourself, and then knowing when to kind of take a little step back in order to A, prevent injuries to prevent burnout, and then honestly just to stay sane, you know? Yeah, I think um, a lot of that comes down to coaching and kind of educating the person on why you're doing it and actually talking to them, not just saying, hey, here's your macros for the next week, and then feeling like they're letting you down because they're off plan now. Yeah, and I, I, like I said, I think it's, the, it's, it's all semantics. You know, when you say the word diet break, then people say, oh, it's a break? No, no, this isn't a break. You're still tracking your food every day. You're still 100% on point. That's why I love the refeed not a break. Yeah. cheat day because refeed oh, implies don't, that don't you, you have a purpose. Yeah. So yeah, refeed or untracked meal is it's all semantics. They're all the same thing. We need you know, a new word for diet break. Let's coin it. I, fuck you, Eric. <laughs> we need a new word. <laughs> no, I like it's not I a like, diet break. We're still dieting. I but like we'll the, figure something out yeah. that makes sense. But so I think the more that we educate people, the more that they realize that that's not a bad thing. The same thing with a deload. When people we say take a step back from training, people are like, oh my god, no, I want to go 110. Yeah. percent Trust me when I say that we've both been there as coaches and as athletes. And sometimes having that person, that's why we both have coaches or mentors, you know, whatever, sure. to kind of have someone objective. Because when you're in that, especially when you're a few weeks out, you, yeah. you're just not thinking logically for yourself, which is why it's important to have someone to kind of say, hey, take a step back. And like I said, if we're, for all the clients that we train for programming, I mean, every few weeks there's a program deload. It's not a, yeah. you don't train for the week. It's just a completely different type of training. If you, so I speak to a lot of people that are potential clients or are interested in coaching and I get their training program and I go, oh, this is a nice training program. How long have you been doing it? A uh, year and a half. And it's literally the same sets, reps. If you're not undulating intensity, training, taking off, tapering, doing things like this, then you're not actually utilizing the principles that we already kind of hold true in yeah. exercise science for mm -hmm. what is the best practice. Yeah. So there, there's a lot that, you know, I think that they're, again, kind of like with all the stuff we're talking about, I think that it's important to change things. It's important to not change them too frequently, but you can't not change them ever. Right. So you don't need to change, you know, your new workout every, you know, some people really freak out. Like, I need a completely different thing every four weeks. It's like, no, 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 you don't. No, I think but, a simple rule is when you start to notice you're not getting any progress, yes. you're starting to feel stagnant. Progress is, 
and there's a whole bunch of different ways you can measure progress, specifically with body lift. With power lifting, it's pretty cut and dry, or I guess Olympic lifting too. You know, you're either getting stronger, <laughs> you're doing things with better technique, yeah. you know, but with bodybuilding, it's very different. Well, well even with bodybuilding, the psychology of it, I think we often go, oh, well, I can't curl any more weight this week. Mm -hmm. But then we start to go, well, I'm kind of losing interest because I'm not seeing yeah. momentum. But you so could, you have to you have to pay attention to the psychology of it. If it's the psychology, maybe a different program is better for you if it's going to get you yes, excited. Of course. There, that's why I'm big we're big on variations. Yeah. But also, again, coming back to, you know, I don't know, everything's dichotomous. Is that the word I'm looking for? It's dichotomous, stupid. I like it. Okay, yeah, that I'm works. Not <laughs> Sound so you said I sounded stupid earlier, so I gotta throw out some big words. So I this, sound is, this is female logic. <laughs> At no point did I say you sounded stupid. I Lauren just, doesn't sound like she has a masters. That's right. <laughs> You're talking down to me because you think I'm dumb. See, that's the problem. No, you and can I have a discussion with you about an intervention that my wife had with me recently? <laughs> what? So apparently, I used the word yes. Oh my much. god, she texted me about that. I was dying. I was like, Why oh. does my wife tell me that it's too feminine? And I can't. Okay. Use, I well, can't say yes anymore. Uh, I, I say. I hang out with a lot of girls. I, <laughs> I my, love it. My period is probably syncing up. I am very partial to the word yes. There's three girls in this room right now, <laughs> and me. Like, it is too much estrogen. <laughs> Yeah. Amazing. Um, oh, you mentioned that you, you watched the Dorian Yates podcast, right? Loved it. The three yes. hour one with Joe Rogan. I, I can't I, believe how fast that flew by. I listened to a little bit of it, but I didn't get into all of the training stuff. So do you want to kind of just talk about, I just think his approach was really interesting and anyone who hadn't, hadn't listened to it or isn't going to yeah. listen to it, I think that kind of ties in because he, he obviously was the best in the world for many years. And yep. he trained very intensely. He switched things up, but he never necessarily overtrained. And the only person I listened to, he was very big on that. So kind of go. You know, a lot of a lot of times we get so caught up in what is right and perfect and science and evidence based, and the application of stuff. I think obviously has to be taken really into account. And with Dorian Yates, you know, people will point at the fact that oh, well, maybe he was on steroids. Obviously, he was. He talks about that openly. But his training yeah. principles were were you know, founded kind of in the late 70s by like mm -hmm. the Mensers, yeah. and he applied it to himself where he would work up to one single work set per exercise. So on chest day, he would literally only do three working sets. And when you hear that, you go, oh, that's, that's not a lot of working sets. But his warm-ups were very intense. His focus was second to none, and the intensity of those sets was, was off the charts where he was actually doing like, you know, uh, like negatives, and, yeah, he would negative, do drop yeah. sets. He had a training partner yeah. that would actually really have, and I used to, I remember watching the Dorian Yates. The Blood whole, and guts were Yeah, oh my yeah. gosh. And just watching some of those workouts and incorporating them myself when I had a really good training partner, yeah, you get crazy sore. Um, the amount of focus and mental energy you expend in a workout that only takes you 45 minutes to an hour, mm -hmm. uh, really, and really. And you said you worked out, what, like four days a week, right? Four days a week. Mm -hmm. And you know, and, and when I think about that, I also think, well, you know, when he got to that stage, he had been training for probably 15, 20 years. He didn't start out training four days a week, but he had learned, A, how to really target the muscle. I think, you know, one of the hardest things to do when you first start training is like, okay, it's, it's like chest day. Are you actually doing bench properly to hit your chest? Or are you just hitting triceps and shoulders, yeah. right? He was a master at technique, form, the mind-muscle connection, so, and then you throw obviously, into that some good genetics. Obviously that all takes time, but I think it was really cool to hear from somebody who was as successful as him, and he, he said it, he goes, if you, I would have done anything to be the best in the world, he said if that meant working out six hours a day, or it meant working out for 30 minutes once a week, I was going to do it. Yeah. So to him, he felt that this was optimal, it's not going to be optimal for everyone and everyone's goals, but I think it's really, really interesting and kind of speaks to what we're talking about, like you train and you kill it, but you know kind of when to step back, so that's why I wanted to bring that up. Yeah, he would um, truly, truly not train his muscle again until it was recovered, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes five, six days between training sessions, which and no, that's not our training is, yeah. you know, most people are doing twice a week, I mean. No, maybe not everyone can do that, but I just thought it was right. cool to kind of touch on, you know, Somebody at that level. Well, the, the Olympia era champion right after him, Ronnie, was famous for training with a much higher volume, mm -hmm. much higher frequency, yeah. and obviously got great results yeah. as well. So, so. There's, so there's a million different ways to do it, but knowing, I think the biggest takeaway from this podcast is knowing kind of when to take a step back, when that is going to be most useful for you, so you do not become this chronic, go come into this chronic overtrain state. And again, at some point, if you're in a contest prep, 
this is going to happen. If you are training for a powerlifting meet, this is going to happen. It's called overreaching. Yeah. But if it becomes a chronic thing that is not programmed in, right? For powerlifting, it's very programmed. You're going to overreach in order to have to super compensate they're and gonna, then hit it. They're going to overload it, you on volume yeah. and then but, shortly after reduce volume, increase intensity, but, so you get that super. That program. is that is structured. That is a yes. few week period, and that, that is, is a micro cycle is, within your giant yeah. macro cycle. For bodybuilding. I feel like a lot of people can fall into that for months at a time yeah. and particularly again females just because we always feel like we need to do more and I, again I've learned, Paul's learned through experience, through coaches, through coaching and through yeah. clients that it's not necessary and it can actually be very detrimental and harmful to your long term progress. I want everyone to kind of think, and I am the, so guilty of this, so I'm not talking down to anyone, I'm talking to myself too, yeah. that we uh, forget that we want to be doing this for years, uh, particularly bikini girls. And uh, like for bodybuilders, people are like, oh, I'm going to be doing this, I'm taking a year off and going to do, this. like that's very normal I will for men. be competing when I'm like seven years yeah. old. Yeah, uh, that's so normal yeah. for, for especially males, right? For females or just even bikini, just any anyone really though. We kind of get, we forget that, you know, competing is supposed to be lifelong. And if we do show, 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 prep, 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 no break, yeah. no break, no break, you're gonna burn yourself out at some point. Everyone has a different point, but everyone has a point yeah. that where that's gonna happen. So I think it's important if you want to have longevity in this sport at all, you need to properly periodize things and kind of take a step back before you become that overtrained, you know, syndrome or have those symptoms chronically for months. Yeah, and, and, and honestly, like. We always talk about the chronic symptoms of training, but also like if you get like mentally burnt out, like the psychology oh, gosh, of like, I've been there too. Yeah, like, like when I when I was in my twenties and I loved the gym and I would put in like you know I would get the new Flex magazine and I had like a <laughs> six week you know to a huge back workout and I would I would implement all these things and could after, you say yes? Yes, <laughs> I, I don't think I'm allowed. That would be, that would be a, a yes moment. <laughs> But the magazine. Yes. I, I would I would get to a point where I would just get stagnant. I wasn't making progress, and, and I would just stop going to the gym for a couple of weeks at a time, until I kind of got that like that excitement back about it because I found some new program. Mm -hmm. But the exciting thing about like learning about exercise science over the last you know five years specifically, and when I started you know with a coach, gosh, in 2007, is I've never had that happen since. Mm -hmm. Now that I've learned to understand like training principles mm -hmm. and undulating periodization and getting involved in either powerlifting or, you know, even sometimes like 40, 50 rep sets or just, just different variations on the same kind of approach, I never get bored in the gym. I never want to take time off. Yeah. I always want to try to hit a new PR, whether it's a rep PR or a post-injury PR. Yeah, or what there's kind of, so many ways yeah. to increase training. And I think a lot of times, People will fall into thinking that it's only like powerlifting, you know, like, and it's not, it's not even that, like, literally with shoulder raises, you can add more sets, you can do different variations, yeah. you can have rest pause, you can have partials, you can have, I'm gonna do five more reps this week. Like, I mean, there's so many little ways to change things up. And yeah, we kind of, I think, honestly, a lot of times we just kind of forget some of those things, and that's why it's great to, like, watch videos or mm -hmm. remind yourself, like, oh, yeah, remember that movement? I haven't done that in years. And then you mm -hmm. get back into it and you fall in love with it again, and there you're off. For another four, six, eight, yeah, 12 exactly. weeks, whatever it is. And that's important to pay attention to. And I think it's one of the good things about being a coach is that when I put someone on a training program and they're training for six, 12 weeks and they're like, I really like this program, I'm making progress. Progress isn't the most important thing. Like, okay, you're getting stronger, but if you're getting bored as well, yeah. then let's just look at, okay, so you don't like squatting. Let's try, let's try a different variation yeah. for the squat and then let's get strong with that. And sometimes that's all it takes. And yeah, you're a few weeks weeks and then you know you can move on with a new program. Let's talk about something that happens with clients. Um, and I didn't always understand this principle, but I would I would request someone to take a day off, two days off, mm -hmm. and I would notice that they would lose weight after that and they would almost be frustrated like why did I drop weight when I didn't train and it's only really recently like come to my attention how important understanding like inflammation is yeah inflammation and cortisol and your your body is again think about what we're doing particularly in a uh, most of this we've been talking about in a calorie restricted state because everything's kind of amplified in a calorie restricted state versus yeah. Of course, you, you can definitely be overtrained in the off season as well, which is even more important because the goal, more important to take time back, take, 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 take time off because the goal is obviously building muscle and staying healthy. 
but this happens, I think, a lot faster when you're in a chronic calorie de you know, yeah, deficit. Yeah, you, you also throw onto that the time crunch. Yeah, like so the there's just a, there's a bunch of things, but when you're in a calorie deficit and you're training hard, and you're doing cardio, and you have the show date, and you're trying to meal prep and trying to work and trying to pose, and, and all these things kind of add up, we can get very, very stressed. And that's what Eric said too with the kind of diet breaks. Some people actually lose weight, or they lose weight with the double refeed that will do sure. because it's almost like this like whoosh effect, right? Yeah. And everyone's different. Some people will gain weight when they eat more because of you know glycogen storage and and you know just more food in your gut. And then some people will lose weight just because they kind of had this like break and this like inflammation went down, stress yeah. went down, and you just almost your body just kind of went like thank you and then now yeah. we can now we're okay because when you're in a calorie deficit and you're doing a million and one things your body's really stressed out and it's kind of like wait are we you know i never want to play this evolutionary chair scientist or whatever people call it but like you know think about your body is your it, it's almost like your controlled starvation like you're like wait when am i going to eat next like what's going on yeah. your body your body is your your brain is thinking about all these things for context prep and then your body's like wait what the hell are we doing and it's just kind of a lot going on so sometimes again taking that step back taking that rest day, taking that refeed day, sleeping, you know, all yeah. these things are massively important to your physique goals and, you know, your weight loss goals. Yeah, especially when you can start to, like, understand these things as a coach, as, you know, as you and I have worked with more people over the years, I've started to look for these signs mm -hmm. and there's nothing wrong with taking a day off, you know, a couple days off, even a week off from the gym. Like, you don't actually lose muscle for three weeks or more. Yeah. So you might lose some muscle shape or fullness. size, fullness. Uh, you might lose some of your neural adaptation to like strength. Like if you're squatting heavy three days a week and you take a week off, yeah, the bar's gonna feel like a ton of bricks on your back the first day back because that's a neural adaptation that you can become detrained through. So don't, powerlifters, don't take a full week off before you meet. I know that's like a popular thing for some people, but uh, that's I a would, philosophy. I would argue that, but. <laughs> uh, well, what we, what we like to do, you know, just, it's, it's just hit some heavy singles like that week, so you're really backing off the volume but keeping intensity high. But just the idea that, like, I think people are afraid, like, if I don't go to the gym, I'm going to lose muscle. Yeah, and the typically what I see is the people who stress out that much about it actually have a bad negative response because of how stressed out they are. And, yeah, well, uh, the mind is so That powerful, is, so yes. I mean, honestly, people being stressed about you know, not training or stressed about, oh my God, I'm not on this perfectly. Honestly, I think one of the best people who I see handle the stressors of prep and life okay. is Alberto Nunez. <laughs> yeah, it I mean, seems like he's not in prep. I mean, he's a, he's a pretty low stress guy. I would I would venture to say, if anyone knows Alberto, he's a pretty low stress guy. Um, but for the most part, he talks about being fairly consistent and not 100% perfect. And he'll post his stuff when he's traveling, like his yeah. numbers. And they vary day to day, but for the most part, they're pretty consistent. And now, obviously, Birdo is you know one of the top natural bodybuilders, so you know he knows what he's doing. He's been doing this for a very long time. He doesn't have 800, you know, like 80 pounds to lose. Uh, he has a lower amount of body weight to lose, and he gives himself an exorbitant amount of time. So there's a lot of factors that go into this, but he just you know he's a really good example of how being relaxed with well, things. Well, definitely, actually, definitely be getting Alberto on here. Yeah, at some he's point awesome. In the future, uh, someone I've always looked up to and been friends with from the message board days. And the one thing I rem really remember about Alberto, this was back when I had an office job. He said one of his preps, one of his goals for his contest prep, and this was probably like 2008, 9, 10 around that time, was he didn't want the people in his office to know that he was in contest prep because. People tend to change their entire behavior, behavior system. They change the way they eat, they change the way they dress, they change the way they act, their moods. His goal was to go into contest prep, and what this meant was he spent his entire improvement season kind of maintaining these kind of lifestyle factors so that when he went into prep, people were like, well, he's still eating the same foods, he's still kind of doing the same behavior, so there was no huge shift. He didn't gain 40 pounds of body fat and then start prep and start. So I always admired that about him. I thought that's a, that's a great way to be because I hate being pigeonholed. And you know, when you work in an office environment, as soon as you start prep and you start bringing in your fish and things like that, uh, it can kind of put people off or just kind of give people a different opinion of you. And I, oh, I, how I, are you feeling today? You're like, I'm tired of hungry. It's just what it is. My favorite one was like, <laughs> oh my God, I could never have the willpower to do that. How do you do that? And it's like, you just do it. There's no willpower. Like, Food is just. A I'm gonna stop before to an end. <laughs> This food is my goal. Like, yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it's always been so easy for me to like flip the switch and just be in prep. Like, it's almost easier in a way because you know what you have to do. Yeah. Like, this is your plan. You execute it. Like, it's yeah. It's, it's the off season that's kind of 
has too much. I've, I've always talked about that. Like it's yeah. sometimes it's actually easier to eat out on prep because yeah. I don't have. I'm not giving myself the option. There are no options. There's no options. I'm getting What's whatever. What's the leanest yeah. meat you have? What is? Yeah, exactly. What? I'll what, take that dry. Yeah, exactly. And then when I'm in the off season, it's kind of like, oh, well, what about the? Oh, wait, wait, yeah. You know, and that just that's the nature of off season and prep, and that's just life, obviously. But um, yeah, I don't know. I think he's a really good example of somebody who can be fairly low stress, have a lot of things going on in his life as far as like you know travel and work, and not being a thousand percent consistent but being pretty close every day yeah. and still making really good progress. So yeah. I kind of wrapping this up, I know we talked a little bit all over the board, which is um, kind of normal for us, <laughs> but hopefully you guys like that. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Uh, sorry if you don't, but we, we kind of tend to ramble and talk in circles, but that's why we wanted to start the podcast. We just kind of like have a long form medium to talk. Yeah. These conversations, yeah. you know, uh, I find them interesting and I thought it would just be fun to share them. And so we think they're interesting. Hopefully you do too. <laughs> and when we start getting guests on here, we'll definitely be more focused. Like when we have Dom on here or Aaron Stern, whoever we get to come on here, Bill Campbell, obviously we're going to talk about their specific background and what, you know, what their interests are. But with us, we just have so many interests. I think yeah. our thoughts are always changing and, um, you know, but I think that's good. I think it's, yeah. if we weren't like that, then we would be like those people who we don't want to be like who are always doing the same things and and honestly like it's hard sometimes to like change your way of doing something because you're like oh shit well I talked about this for so long but I think it shows that like hey I'm always learning stuff yeah and we always have to be moving forward if I told people something a year ago and I don't do that anymore it's not that I was wrong just what I knew at that point and now I've right. just changed it so it's the clean eating podcast okay what'd you eat this week did you eat clean I ate clean okay and the podcast <laughs> like uh, yeah I don't want to get stuck in kind of that rhetoric where we're no. uh, so hopefully not evolving yeah, hopefully you guys liked this, uh, kind of bringing it back in a little bit. When there are times to push and there's times to pull back, and it's really hard to know that for yourself uh, in the off season, particularly hard during prep, which is why it's important to either have a coach, a mentor, a friend, somebody helping you out in that regard. Yeah. Don't feel bad for taking a day or two off, taking program deloads. These are all things that are very important for your long-term goals, because you're prepping for one contest, we're speaking obviously for bodybuilders or for one meet, but you have to think about your whole like timeline of competing, yeah. whether it's, uh, that's somebody um, for powerlifting, Ed Cohn is an amazing person to talk to about that because he was so good at looking at like the big picture and never push things to where he, you know, it, obviously you need to, you plan things out. Yeah. I talked to him about this. I did a Q and A with him. Yeah, he's, 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 he's great so, he's so planned out with all of his blocks and it was almost like so simple, right? I'm like, how did you not like want to like jump the gun, right? And he's like, because then that wouldn't have worked out for later down the line and then that wouldn't have worked out for, you know, like right. it, it all makes sense when you're like, oh man, well, why didn't I think of that? But it's, it's hard when we're in the moment. So kind of being able to take that step back, if you can't be objective with yourself, you know, then, you know, you probably <laughs> need to, uh, hire someone else or have someone as a, you know, like I said, well, a friend or whatever. Well, the ego can come into play. Maybe a guy next to you in the gym is squatting an extra yeah. plate than you and you're like, well, I don't want to look like, a, you know, yeah. you know, following programming can be difficult, very, especially the week where you're deloading your tapering mm -hmm. and, you know, somebody else but is showing you up. It's very important, you guys, for both diet and training to kind of know when to take a step back. It's really important in the off season, but it's even more important, I would say, during prep just because you're at a higher susceptibility for just being burnt out for injuries and things like that. So. Yeah. Hopefully this was helpful, y'all. Uh, I always feel like I say that. I kind of feel like I need to stop saying that. <laughs> I hope this was helpful because uh, I'm like, shit, then I'm like, or, I don't know. I, I hope it wasn't helpful. <laughs> don't don't, really, don't, don't, don't say that, but <laughs> we really hope this wasn't helpful for you guys. No. Uh, so hopefully you enjoyed the fuck, I said it again. Yeah, this was, this was a good time. <laughs> I don't know what to say. <laughs> it was definitely helpful. Y'all know it to be true. <laughs> I think my take home message from this thing would be, don't be afraid to give yourself a day off. Don't be afraid to make one scheduled day every now and then, once a week, every two weeks, to go, do nothing. No cardio, no training. I always Sleep do that during prep. Take naps, yeah. like Netflix and chill. Whatever gets you through the day without going to the gym. You know, like, mm -hmm. you know, you know, we both know Emily Hayden, love her to death, amazing. One of the hardest things she has trouble doing is not doing anything. Mm -hmm. It's very tough for her. She would rather do cardio six times a day than not at all. Yeah. And so one thing I've had to like impart upon her is how hard she is on her body. And it's amazing what happens when she actually like takes a little time off and mm -hmm. recovers. She's a very good athlete. But you know, the whole mindset thing that we're talking about, you know, it applies to everybody from amateurs all the way up to the highest pros. Like we all 
have this mindset and it can be kind of hard to step back and take a big picture mm -hmm. like and that's why it's important to think about your long-term goals think about you know how many years you're going to be competing not just this one show and to really yeah. give yourself enough time i feel like every time i do a podcast people ask me about this and like time is the most important aspect. You, if you give yourself enough time, you won't feel worried about these kinds of things. Yeah, as, you won't feel as worried. You're still going to feel worried, but you're not going to feel as worried. When you think about contest prep being 12 weeks, you think, oh, that's really hard because it is because you only do 12 weeks. But if you do contest prep for 20 or 22 weeks, you're not starting off with this huge deficit, tons of cardio. You're kind of easing your body into it and allowing it to adapt. So, you know, the you're one not like thing, coming in on like three wheels, like hoping you're going to. I like always feel like I'm not even in prep until I'm about. 10, 12 weeks out, 8, 10, you know, like when it actually starts to get low body fat, that's the issue, not the fact that I'm starving myself and doing too yeah. much cardio. Like, so when you allow that to happen, yeah, contest prep is going to be hard. It's going to get difficult, but it doesn't need to be unnecessarily so because you waited too long or didn't take the right yes. approach. All right. So can I get an amen from the <laughs> sermon? <laughs> All right, guys. Well, I think uh, we've done enough preaching today. We've kind of talked about where we've been. <laughs> We talked about some overtraining principles and you know kind of how we apply them it's 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 tough to talk about things on a very specific nature because you know we we coach a lot of different people who we've done a lot of different things with and we know a lot of different people oh. so we're just trying to give everybody like a insight there's, yeah there's so. no right or wrong answer uh and there's different there's different variations and nuances for everyone in every case yeah. So honestly, what, why we can't give anything straightforward. Yeah, it, it's, it's so, so specific to your goal, your timeline, yes. your everything. So, yeah, that's, that's, you know, I wish we could actually meet and talk to every single one of you and give you advice. And if you come to the Olympia and find us, we will do that. Um, we love to talk and chat and do seminars and, you know, things of these nature. So if you ever want specific advice, like DMs are very hard for me. I don't do a lot of that. I get a lot of yeah, requests out of there. Uh, but Karina see, is handling my is email now, so perfect. like she's kind of helping me with you know managing my time so I can be a better coach because I was getting a little overwhelmed with stuff. And so if you can find us at an event and an expo, stop us. Yeah. I actually had someone say, "Oh, I saw you at the Tampa Pro, and I wanted to talk to you. Why didn't you?" I was scared, and I'm like, "Are we scary looking?" <laughs> Maybe I have resting dick faces. I think. <laughs> Like I just, I don't smile a lot. I think, but I'm I'm the nicest, most calm person you're ever gonna meet in person. Just come say hi to me. Uh, the only time I, I would ever say I can't talk is if I'm like in the middle of something with a client or something. Yeah, right? exactly. Like, and I'll, then I'll get right back to you. But you know, Lauren's the same way. She has, you know, she can have her moments where she doesn't feel happy. But I promise you, if you find her and you say hi, she's gonna be appreciative. The one thing that I think Lauren. Uh, <laughs> Lauren doesn't look happy a lot when you see her. That's literally what we just said. <laughs> like, you know, like you can, you know, you're, you're not, you're not a Jenna level of RBF. Uh, My client like, Jenna has the best resting bitch face ever. She just owns it. Uh, yeah, she, she she's amazing. Uh, no, we're very, we're very personable in person. And, was that personable in person? Uh, and yeah, definitely not scary at all. We're, we're just as goofy and uh, say silly things in person as well, we Well, we get excited, like, you know, like you put this stuff out into the universe and you don't really know. And then, you know, we go to the Tampa Pro and I think, I had more people come up to me about the freaking podcast at the Tampa Pro yeah, we had, than any other thing I do. I've gotten so much stuff about the podcast was, already. Like, and then me and Lauren saw each other, like, oh my god, someone said, yeah, someone said a podcast. I was like, wow, this is like, yeah. it's actually a thing. It's not just uh, our parents our and friends kids. that are listening to it. <laughs> so thank you guys so much for watching. We really appreciate the support. We appreciate all the messages, all the, you know, the putting it in your story, getting the word out there. I mean, it's just been an amazing response from this. So we're going to keep going and uh, yeah. Hopefully this was enjoyable, and I'm going to keep saying that until I find something better to close with. So, hope y'all enjoyed this, <laughs> and uh, let us know if you can think of a better way for me to close the show. <laughs> we no, should close really. it with Borat. I mean, hey y'all is definitely the intro, but I'm not really sure what to do for the outro. So, go bye! Nice go, go fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't like this, you can go fuck yourself. No, we're just kidding. Kind of. No, I'm totally kidding. <laughs> okay, bye. Alright, we're ready right now. Alright, that's gonna be it from uh, from Tampa. This is coming out in the next day or two and uh, the, the following one will be on the first, first and the fifteenth for a new podcast. Yeah. So thank you guys, talk to you soon.